Um, thank you all for coming on Friday night. Um, this is our the um, fourth Gateway series. I am Sumi Nakaya. I am, uh, and this is the Gateway series hosted by the New York Brutal Association. It's very much like a place for us to get together um, the brutal practitioners and observers and really address the cultural aspects of, uh, of our practices, which we never really have time to do in our day, the busy daily life. So we just invite speakers among ourselves, uh, from amongst ourselves, and just compare notes on, on different styles and, and practices um, in relation to Budo. And today I am so excited um, to, uh, to have Tiki Sese with us. Um, as usual, um, I will start with a, like a little short video clip of, um, or, oh, before I get to that, um, let me just emphasize that today's subject is the sword, the Japanese sword with Tiki Sensei. Um, as usual, before we start, um, I will um, run a short clip and just a visual of what sword, the Japanese sword is. Um, and then I introduce the speaker, our guest speaker, Tiki Sensei. And we're gonna get into the sort of, you know, a little bit of the, um, the discussions um, on, on the Japanese word. So here we go. Um, Sorry about the ad. Can everyone hear it? Oops, I'm sorry. Tell me there's no audio on the on the videos. Okay, one second. Sorry, there's no sound. No. No. Okay, one second. I have to do that again. Um. How how do I do that? Um. Okay, it's a little difficult. Um, One second, let me do this again. Um, share screen. And, okay, I'll try again. How's that now? Yes, no? No. No, there's no sound? No sound. Okay. Hmm. It, it worked before. Let's see. How about now? Yep. They've been around for over 1,000 years. As the iconic Japanese culture has shared traces throughout the world. And thanks to the involvement of a blacksmith, a potter, and an ancient scroll, you can still buy a totally 100% custom made katana blade today. Seriously awesome. So, random question 
How exactly is this ancient knowledge of making iconic Japanese samurai swords still around? Well, it's a pretty incredible story of ancient scrolls, fiery forges, and the most expensive steel on the planet. Let's take a deeper look at how the sword and the scroll are linked. Shimane Prefecture in Japan is wild with plunging cliffs and volcanic islands. It's full of sacred Shinto shrines and waterfalls, believed to bring victory to bullfighters, sumo wrestlers, and drink its waters. And sometimes its rivers run red. Blood red. But not with blood. That's disgusting. With iron deposits. And that's how the blacksmith made a living in this region. He smelted that iron with the steel until he and his buddy, the potter, found an ancient scroll. That taught them how to make, drum roll please, samurai swords. Total job upgrade. But nowadays, there are only about 200 traditional swordsmiths left in Japan. Shunji Kobayashi is one of them, thanks to his grandfather, the black. So maybe lost sound. Okay, uh, apologies about the sound. Did you catch most of it? I hope. Okay, um, if not, we will share this PowerPoint so that um, you have a link to the video. Um, but that little video really made me realize how much I don't know about a sword and there was so much to it. So I'm very excited uh, to have um, Tiki Sensei, um, Malcolm Tiki Sherwin Sensei today with us. And if we say um, that, um, that something is a life work, um, I think that really speaks about Tiki Sensei and a sword because he began fencing when he was only six years old and at age eight, he studied judo, um, the introduction to the Japanese martial arts. And at age 14, he began learning EI. So he must be doing this much longer than any of us. Um, and he also has done Aikido. So he's a really multitasking, the Budo practitioner. Um, and what also, you know, uh, you know, we are going to learn so much from Tiki Sensei um, because he not only is a practitioner, but he also um, studied the the the, the forging. And uh, he spent two and a half years working studying the forging of Japanese sword with swordsmen. And so that's um, my first question to Tiki Sensei. That is. What was your, what drew you, I mean, what was your introduction to martial arts and in particular the swords? So that'd be my first question, Tiki says, and then we get into today's agenda. Tiki Sensei? I think you're muted. Okay, I need, I need to unmute you, sorry. Hold on a second. Can you unmute yourself now? All right. Ah, uh, yes. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Yes. So, yeah, Sticky Sensei, maybe you can just spend just a minute or two um, telling us about your introduction to sword. Um, how did you get into it? What was your what was your entry point to sword? You mean about the particularly uh, the, the 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 forging of an iponto, yes, or the interest that's... in the sword itself? 
I think not, both actually. Not the practice of yai and things. Both, I that, think. That was in the little text I started early yeah. in. It was a complete accident that I started uh, because I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> at 14. But uh, they were holding yai classes from the um, uh, Zen temple that was in New York City in, in uh, Saldam where I practiced fencing. And um, so I had some free time and I, I started, I just thought the yai was interesting, so I started it. And um, the man that was teaching was, his name was Reverend Khan. I don't know, some old people might uh, remember that man. He taught yai and kendo at the, the Zen temple up on, I guess it was around uh, 90th Street or something. And that's how I started practicing yai. But my interest in the sword was actually earlier. My father was an arms collector, and he had a, a number of of Japanese swords. And he explained a little bit to me about them. I, you know, I listened and I, I thought they were fascinating, and uh, so it sort of interested me for later on as well. Wait. So today, I mean, uh, you know, there's so much to sword related to the study of the sword, and we'll probably um, scratch the surface of it today. Um, maybe go over a little bit the, the, at the minimum what the practitioner should know about sword. But maybe take a sense, you can just look at work us through really quickly about what there is to learn about sword and different aspects of it. Yeah, um, it's it's a a lot of different categories. We think by saying Japanese stored or I'm studying the Japanese sword um, or that you practice yai that it actually you learn about the sword. We, the sword is not um, as simple quite as that. So there are several aspects and one of the interesting things and this is what I wanted to put forward in this in this talk is that a practitioner of yai um, he will only um, profit from learning more on a cultural level. And of course, um, since he practices yai, he's using a, an, a, a Japanese sword, and you can go on practicing and know nothing about the tool that you're using. On the other hand, uh, you're going to expand your cultural horizons by learning about that particular um, tool and how it, what was its history, how was it made. So the practitioner um, at the, a very minimum to get started should actually make the effort of learning all the names of the various parts of the sword and the tool that he uses so that he is completely uh, at ease with uh, speaking about, you know, the parts of the sword, the parts of um, uh, the tool that he uses, you know, it's sort of like somebody doesn't need to know, you know, if they're a carpenter, they don't need to know how is a plane or a saw actually made, but at least he should know a little bit, first of all, about, you know, his saw, his tools, uh, and that's a first step. So I would like to um, start by telling and encouraging people that the most important thing you can do is get some diagrams that um, of the sort that you'll see later in these slides that will um, familiarize you with the names of all the parts of the sword. And the interesting thing most of all is to take the kanji or the Japanese characters that are used for writing um, about those, you know, for those parts and look and see what those characters actually mean. I just saw um, a page, you okay. see me, you just went yeah. through a page where there are some. And um, let me um, take the second upper from the left. Uh, hanabi. Okay, this, one. this is a good example. This means the sparking 
that you see in the fire when you're heating up steel, for example. Um, it's written with two characters. The first one means a flower, and the second one means the fire. fire. So fire flowers, it's actually rather, rather illustrative and, and beautiful of what makes a spark. So if you don't look at the kanji, which are pictograms, you know, we call them ideograms, but actually each one is a, is a picture. If you look and take the time to understand what the pictogram is saying, it will give you a deeper understanding of what what the the name is actually implying and what it's about so i that would be my first thing is to take the names of all the parts of the sword and um you know get the the ca japanese characters and take the time to actually look at them and work out what is the picture that is shown by that uh, character. Uh, it's not a difficult study, but it it's a good start, and you really learn a, an awful lot of things that add to your to your knowledge um, as you as you practice. For example, here in front of us, I see a diagram. I, I suppose everybody has the same one, and we have the parts of the blade and the parts of of the mounting of this you know the sword in its mounts now if you take for example uh, the word hamon it is um, a line the temper line on the sword and it's never there's never two identical they can be straight which are simple and therefore you could say well there's a lot of straight ones yes of course um, but they they can become very very complex, but each one will present differences, and so they call it hamong, which means the signature or the symbol or the uh, representation, the image of the edge. Mm -hmm. In other words, the edge signature. So if you learn those characters and you and you relate it to the word hamon and you know that you're going to be so much more um confident and capable about what you're talking to people when you explain you know this is the edge of this you know this is the the temper line on the sword it it's really interesting so that's a good start i don't want to waste a lot of time just talking about that but i hope that gives you a little idea of the importance that it can represent just to learn all the names and you've got a list here the uh all of the different names i'd be happy to be more detailed about it but it's um actually very simple memorize them and then study the kanji and then understand understanding what the kanji represent the uh, characters uh you you'll be um you know really happy you did it i think so absolutely and one i mean the sort of you know at least understand the construction is the first step i do want to go back to a, a few um a slides back and to sort of also show the depth of you know what is there to appreciate because well, let me let me just add from then on because um, you know, all I've said now is basically learn the nomenclature, learn the names of all the parts of the swords, and take the time to study how they are written in the Japanese language, and then understand a little bit about the ideograms. Well, the next step is that uh, the, there are several uh, dimensions to the Japanese sword that, that can be interesting, and some people will find one more interesting than others but let me just uh the, this is the good illustration for example the sword and its evolution mm -hmm. how did it evolve and in what context and that obviously will bring you to history mm -hmm. history means not only the history about the sword specifically but it also means 
um, gee, you know, what was Japanese um, society like at such and such time? Uh, for example, um, it has an effect on the sword and how it is used according to the social context in which um, the, the samurai was called on to use the sword. Mm -hmm. So you see the shapes change, you see basically uh, the, 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 well, actually the dimensions um, change considerably because they need it for different things. You will see, for example, if you go back to um, the late Heian, early Kamakura period, well, there's something to study is the, you know, the periods in Japanese history, but you'll find very thin and elegant looking blades and were for formal wear very often and were not necessarily destined for um, heavy battlefield use. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of the society at that time. Then you come to a, a little later period that you see there, Nam Bokucho. Right, this one, and, big one. Uh, this great big hefty yeah. one yeah. with a bit with a large point. And if you understand the historical context, what was society, what was happening at that time, you will understand why the sword is the way it is. In other words, it was a period where there was warfare and conflicts. Nam Bokucho actually means uh, north south. Um, period and what happened was that the emperor actually they became two emperors mm -hmm. and they were had warring factions each one so there's a period of warfare and so swords needed to be used practically and uh, and and they were outdoors they were on battlefield they weren't in a city or an urban environment so a big hefty dependable blade was was desirable so you see the that the, the, at that time they're going to manufacture everything according to a, a whole different set of criteria so this is an important point the history and the evolution of the sword and how the the two things constantly uh, interact so that's that's one of the um, interesting dimensions that we can study that we should learn about yeah so let's go to the uh, that's really sort of today's agenda so to speak uh, right we will talk about the construction we'll talk about the evolution um uh, which is you know, and there's a, a whole yet another dimension the forging and another dimension of like appreciation the parts of it right um so there, there's that, that there's a lot that we can't cover in one hour <laughs> absolutely the 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 making of the sword takes you into the field of metallurgy and learning about practically how the techniques uh, for forging this, making the steel, forging the steel, making it into a sword. That's a whole nother dimension of study that people can apply themselves to. And uh, it's actually quite complicated and you have to be ready to uh, take on a little bit of metallurgy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's not always an easy thing. But it's very interesting too. And then one of the most popular things is the idea of looking at a sword and uh, uh, they call it sword appreciation. In Japanese, it's kante. And it's very much like wine tasting in a sense. Right. You know, a wine taster has to study very hard and be very qualified, know an awful lot about wine but he would not be capable of making wine and um, he would know all about it. You know, he would okay. taste a wine and he would tell you where it came from and he could tell you, you know, what chemicals were in it, how much, you know, this and that composed it. And that's what the sword appreciation dimension actually brings to it. And that means studying how the sword um, in detail um, was different from, you know, roughly, you could say 10 year periods, right. literally throughout the whole history of Japan, every 10 years, you could expect to see 
uh, changes. And there were some uh, very major changes, and sometimes they were very sleepy changes. Nothing, nothing really took place. Um, but to be a good Kante person who, who knows all about the sword is a very big study. It's not something that you can sort of say, well, gee, I'll, you know, study one day a month or something. Um, and it's just not the, st the blade or sword itself, but it's also the other parts, not the accessories. Exactly. Exactly. Every, every, there were roughly a team of people would make what, you know, we call a Nippon to, a Japanese sword. So the blade was just the bladesmith. Right. Sense. So it was just the forge uh, at the forge. And that was only the blade. But there was a specialist who made the steel. Mm -hmm. And then there is a specialist who will make only the sword guards, like you see on your screen right now, uh, Tsuba. Yeah. And then there were people who would specialize in small parts, like the Fuchikashira and Menuki. And I... then there were people who were specialized in just wrapping the tsuka there were there's many many oh, ways skamaki, could... right yeah, yeah there are different ways of doing that skamaki and the polishing there's all very specialized and then the polisher was a whole nother art so all of them came together as a, a one after the other in a process that was teamwork and not just an individual can you tell uh, us a little bit about this, the, the, the tsuba we have here? It's like art in and of itself. Okay. You, <laughs> have, you have three uh, different uh, types of tsuba. I, th I thought they were sort of interesting. And they represent uh, overall the three different types of tsuba that you meet, you know, when you, yeah. when you meet collectors and you see tsuba in the museums. They'll be like this. So on your left, you'll notice that it's quite ornate. It's not a really ornate tsuba, but it's an ornate tsuba, and it has precious metals, gold. The flowers are inlaid gold. Um, sometimes there's uh, several different uh, uh, precious metals used, and they're very decorative. Uh, on the other hand, they're also, as you can imagine, more delicate, um, but they're beautiful. It is the pretty. second, the, the, on, the, on the far right, you have a tsuba that was probably most likely made by a swordsmith. Mm. So um, this, this is made out of sword steel. He probably quenched the outside rim like he would quench a sword with the, um, with the same process. And it's made for heavy use, combat use, battlefield use. It's a no-nonsense kind of tsuba, and right. as you can see, it's very simple. And at first glance, you'd say, well, gee, that's sort of ugly, you know, it's all rusty, it's brown and everything. But that was highly appreciated for its practical purposes. Now, um, in, in the middle, you have what's called a skashi tsuba, which was um, a piece of steel, um, a disc of steel that someone cuts out using a little handsaw, right? Mm -hmm. So they cut out the uh, very intricate designs. They were elegant. They were uh, fair. They they weren't a tough battlefield type of tsuba, but they had a whole different idea of being simple in in a sense simplicity now what you have is manji on this particular yeah. one and so it's a it's a relate it's related to buddhism so this is a a, a sort of a symbolic uh tsuba of buddhism that being said the one on the right is also buddhist symbolism those balls on the outside the ah, round things right. are actually called buddha's necklace right. and uh, it was um well, you can go look up Buddha's necklace and yeah. see what you find on it. But that's what that's what it really is. And um, imagine this must be really heavy, you know, adding weights to the to the sword. 
and be, can become a but weapon. It, if it actually balances it too. Mm. It isn't just making it heavier, but then of course, if you're going on a battlefield, you're not supposed to be a weakling anyway. So right. uh, they had heavier weapons and they would want more protection. Mm. Um, I would say right at this point, one of the interesting things that in Japan, all art, whether it be art that you practice physically, like, like our Budo practice, or no theater, or, you know, even like tea ceremony, we have a practitioner who, who demonstrates this. But also, the, on the other hand, we have art as painting, mm -hmm. as calligraphy, as architecture, and so forth and so on. So art is a, it's called in Japanese, you say bijutsu, and it's a very big, big, a field of different activities, but the common basis to all, be it Budo, be it Chanoyu, I mean, tea ceremony, mm -hmm. be it um, temple carpentry or whatever, there are three principles that must always be present and balanced for somebody to call, to, to consider that this is art. And those three qualities are simplicity, mm -hmm. elegance, and power or usefulness. So the interesting thing about these three tsuba is you've got one for battlefield use over on the right, right. and it's pretty rugged. So it's putting the emphasis on simplicity and power uh, and practicality. The one on the left is putting the emphasis on elegance and beauty. And so that's, um, the, the, these are two different things. The one in the middle brings together, yes. well, they all do, they all do with different, different proportions of it. They all bring together simplicity, elegance, and power. Now, if you apply that to your practice and you do your yai, and you say, how can I do a kata and bring it so that it is both simple and um, fairly, um, you know, it, it, you would think it was basic, but it's not basic, really. It's simplicity in, its, in a beautiful sense. How can I bring simplicity with elegance so that it's beautiful as well and still have the power, uh, the cutting power that I need in my kata. It's a very difficult thing, and it takes a long time of practice, I think, to begin to develop, well, first to see it, to feel it, and to say, I want to go in that direction, and to uh, actually begin to demonstrate in your practice that you have those three things. Very few people actually succeed uh, af uh, except after a number of years of practice. Right, which is why the EIE um, is just not the physical exercise. There is a power to it, but it can also be a beautiful and very effective and efficient movement at the same Absolutely. time. Absolutely. When Yagi speaks of ikiyoi, yeah. or you speak of, of, of you know, ki, um, people talk of sometimes kokyudyoku, Mm -hmm. All of those are expressions to talk about the, the power that you should have behind your movements in Budo. Um, you know, it's really, you know, many schools actually, and Muso Shinden or Muso Jikiden is a good example. The whole series, the first series you do emphasizes simplicity. Everything is very... Uh, square and direct, and it, it deals with simplicity. The second series called Hasegawa Eishing Nyu is actually um, very illustrative of, of the idea of bringing elegance mm -hmm. without forfeiting your simplicity that you learned in the first series. So in order to come to simplicity, it, it can be something as small as, 
for example, people having a little quirk when they work. Somebody will go, you know, like this. You don't need that. All you need is just simply pom pom. Not you don't need more. So what it, what is necessary and needed is an aspect of simplicity. But it can be simple. Simplicity can be brutish. So the elegant right. side, the beauty of something, and when you look at Hasegawa Ishin, you it's so flowing and beautiful and turning and 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 that's what it's there for. They're saying, well, now get beauty and simplicity together. And then you come to the third series, Okuden, and its aim is to bring power without sacrificing the simplicity and the elegance. And this is true in all Budo, it is true in all art. And the sword will constantly remind you to remember simplicity, elegance, and usefulness, power together. And it's and, so and that's a wonderful lesson, yeah. I think, and, you know, from Buddha. It's so interesting at the same time. So, yes, we strive for simplicity and beauty. But on the other hand, it's, it's built on the complexity of everything, no? The sword, the thousand years of the history of sword forging, it's a complex process with all the details so that, that, that's, you know, the, the, you know, the it, it actually, I, I, you know, I agree with you and I disagree with you. It's actually not complex. Complex things are usually complex because you're not fully understanding of it. It's, it's how do you work and work and work until you achieve a state of simplicity, ultimate simplicity in what you do. In, um, in, in uh, no theater, for example, one of the one of the highest compliments you can pay an actor is uh, about a movement called suriashi now suriashi is just walking right but it is such a delicate walk that they need that it is you know the the, the act or you know the the, the ulti ultimate compliment is when you say to somebody that you really highly appreciate it as suriyashi. It's really very different from the way we see things here mm. in the West. I, I have to admit that. But, but maybe take a second, just you know, um, to sort of uh, make my point. Uh, look at this. Um, there's a lot going on in this the diagram, the sword. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what what what's going on and and all of this. The, these illustrations are um, aspects that are that are the result of tempering a blade mm. so these are these are the temper lines in different blades and different characteristics of them when a blade um, is cooled down uh, basically it goes from somewhere between say 700 725 degrees centigrade and 950 degrees centigrade I mean, it's not precise, but basically, when you cool the blade from that temperature mm. down to below 500 or 480 or something like that um, degrees centigrade, um, the steel actually has to undergo different transformations. And on the edge steel, it's thinner for one, mm -hmm. and it's also protected by a clay covering that makes the back the, the the back part of the blade cool it cools more slowly ah. so anyway what happens is different forms of crystalline structure within the steel manifest themselves and that's what you're looking at right now I see um, and most of it are variations on uh, Martin site austenite and um, some of these things are actually formations of the same crystals but in a different in a different you know they, they they give a different image you don't see them as the same way i see uh, so a, a tempered sword depending on i'll give you a very good example uh, is just simply the, the temperature, 
without without being more complicated than that. If you um, bring your steel, your blade in the forge at the process of you know quenching it in water, you bring it to seven fifty to say seven seventy degrees mm. centigrade, and you plunge it in in water. Right. Um, the the for the crystalline formation that the martensite will take will be very different from the exact same process, but that you had initially brought the sword up to a 900, around 900 to 950 degrees centigrade before plunging it in the water. And uh, so you can imagine that <laughs> these, the, the, these things change very easily for something very small, not at all, uh, not at all a big thing, and, and very difficult to control. A smith sometimes, um, he, he'll, he'll try to put the conditions to obtain something. He'll say to himself, well, geez, I'd, I'd like to have very fine, in the middle picture you see, co nie. He would like to have very fine nie and a lot of nioi. Nioi is in the picture that says ashi is that very uh, white uh, top of, the, of, mm -hmm. of, the, of that movement. And so you would like to keep a very fine grain so that the, the crystal grains don't grow big as you see uh, those dots in the middle picture. Okay. That's, see, on the, left, on the right hand side, that you can see that they wow. move your arrow to the right. And wow. That, those are big dots. That that indicates to somebody who who's looked a little bit at the question, it, it shows that there was a high temperature used, a higher temperature. And on on the other side, the ashi picture, which has a considerable amount of neoi, it's a much more, uh, it's a, a sort of a softer quench, or it's a less less harsh quench it was a lower temperature most likely you know i wouldn't put my head on the chopping block that you know that he went to 750 and no higher but basically it is something like that so we we know that we could control it to a certain extent right but the re actual result is very often a big surprise and yeah. so uh in a sense what you're hoping for is that it's a good surprise and not a bad surprise. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think I remember your Shada sensor saying that at one point that you, you think that you got it, but you don't know until that sword actually comes out. Oh, I, I think every smith would tell you that. The, uh, the uh, crunching process um, is basically, you, you can never be sure. But you can, all you can do, the, the, the whole thing is that the smith creates environmental characteristics and sticks very closely to them through uh, his protocol you know he, he will do he will repeat kind of a kata in a sense that he has lived through and his experience his empirical experience will tell him geez the la, you know i did this one time and i got a very nice result so let's do everything the same way again and see if Why? we get another result and it becomes repeatable, but it still won't be identical and it won't be the same. Right. So um, the forging process can take you into some absolutely amazingly, uh, what appear complex, but once you begin to, you know, you know understanding is, is, is the yeah. way to find how to simplify complexity. Ah, okay. Yes. So that's, that's coming back to that earlier conversation of, right. Yeah. I mean, all artists, um, you know, it's like the, the art of the sculpture and somebody said, well, how do you do that? You know? And he said, well, I don't know. I, I, I look at the stone and the head is already in there. So I just take everything out that isn't important for that right. to be the sculpture, you know? Well, that's pretty, sounds pretty simple, but he maybe spent a lifetime to be able to really, truly 
uh, do something like that and, yeah. and do it with that simplicity. And that's what we should be looking for in our Buddha practice. And everything that we can study culturally in Japan, and in our case, the sword, will constantly remind us of these principles. Right. I think there's so much talk about the forging process, so I'll leave that for the next occasion. Um, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna run a little clip about how the Japanese sword became the one you know the one side, um, not the double edged sword, but one edged sword. Just so that I will give Tiki Sensei a, a, a chance to like take a you know sip of water, um, and then sort of you know we sort of um, go back to a bit more about evolution and the styles um, um, for for today's session. So good. let me do that. Sounds good. Okay, and I hope you can get the sound right this time. Can you, if not, let me know. Okay, so that kind of gets back to what we are talking about earlier, um, Tiki Sensei, how the you know how the, the the shape and the length evolved. The Nan Bokshu was the biggest, and then it sort of um, goes to probably shorter and lighter um, towards the Edo period. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, what was happening in the, the battlefield, the landscape of the of the warfare 
um, and the evolution of the sword? Yeah, I, I think probably, I mean, from a practical, as, as a yai practitioner, as somebody who does yai, you might sort of uh, find some of these things at first a little bit esoteric and you say, geez, I, do I need to know all that? What, you know, or what shape is my sword and why is it like that? <clears throat> but there's a, an interesting thing. I will just pick one little aspect. If you look at the, 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 the blade that is the fourth from the left, okay? Now, that's a blade from the Muromachi Jidai. In other words, um, it's going to be um, before 1600. It's going to be um, pretty much in a time when they were developing blades that needed to be used on the battlefield, but at the same time, they were worn blade up. Uh, now, if you have a, you know, a, a blade that is hugely long, it makes it very difficult to draw your sword. Right. And so when they began to wear it blade up, it was not for nothing. They, were, they wanted to make it e easily drawn and they could make a practical move to, to actually cut and draw at the same time, which is how Yai began. Uh, which dates back to Muromachi, actually. It's mm. back in that period where you see Yai begin to uh, be talked about or that we can, you know, find its origins. But if you look at that blade and the shape of it, you'll see that it's actually fairly curved. Mm -hmm. It's fairly, it's quite fat. And it looks kind of like a miniature Nambokucho, that great big one on the... Yeah. Okay, so Namboku Cho is a warring period, and then we have another uh, period which is the beginning part of Muromachi, and, right. and, and, and they didn't have the same um, you know, situation of warfare. And then at the end, prior to 1600, you can read about, you know, in the history, um, how Oda Nobunaga and uh, Tokugawa, you know, were always constantly fighting with one another. Right. So there was a, a very active warfare situation in the end of the Muromachi period. And it was outside. So battlefield is, you can swing it around any way you wish. Right. You know, you can, you, there's no restraints. If you look at the uh, next two blades, you'll see that they're significantly straighter. Mm -hmm. And there were even um, late Edo period blades that were absolutely straight. I mean, right. they, 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 they weren't curved at all. Now, if you are, you know, you look at it and you memorize and you say, well, gee, uh, Edo period blades are straighter. Um, why? You know? And it's very interesting because people uh, with the with the period that Tokugawa began, there was a peaceful period. Mm -hmm. It was not warfare for one. Two, people began to move into cities. Right. Edo, so that's Tokyo, right, today. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Kyoto, Nara, and, and other cities existed. And people were, uh, the, the daimyo, the, the different, well, I guess you could call them princes, or the, you know, whatever, the high aristocrats, they, in order to keep an eye on them, they had to come and spend six months per year. Right. Uh, it's called sanking kotai. Very and expensive exercise. <laughs> exactly. They had to bring their whole bloody retinue with them and come and live in Edo for six months, and then they could go back home to their homes and while they were home, out in the country, they would leave their family as hostages to the shogun. So, anyway, the whole cultural and social uh, environment changed. And people were called on to use the sword within an, uh, simply an urban environment. Mm. Now, there's buildings around. You can be indoors, and indoors right. means there's beams over your head, and there's right. narrow, narrow passageways and things like that. So, the way that you would use 
a weapon on a battlefield mm -hmm. or wearing armor suddenly became now a restrained and urban situation right. with mostly it. it's called uh, Hadaka uh, King. So it is when you do have no armor. If you if you um, if you wear armor, it's called you know kachi no ken, and uh, you're 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 using totally different techniques. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these blades, you look at them and they've straightened out, and they've sort of shortened up. Well, the reason they straightened out is because technically, with all the obstacles around you, you were much better off developing ski techniques right. that used stabbing techniques. In a and, pinpoint space, yeah. And a curved blade, or a very highly curved blade even more so, is difficult mm -hmm. to actually do a thrusting movement uh, right. properly with it. So they would they straighten them out, and yet they would still keep a little bit of curve so that they had the option of cutting, as, as I say. So learning about that, you wouldn't want to have a straight blade for doing yai. It's not very comfortable, um, but it would be very good in, in an environment, you know, if you had to use your sword, imagine you had to go down and use your sword in a subway train or something, right? <laughs> Your technique can't be the same. You can't go swinging it all over the place. So the evolution of the of the blade shape and the blade um, the, the, depended on the usage, the way it was being used. And so from what time, if you study a school, uh, what time did it begin? And what period was it was its heyday? It will all tell you things. And each school would say, we are going to have a sword by our local smiths made up specially to be good for our school. You can't use the same blade for Dushin that you could use for Muso Jikiden. Mm -hmm. Eishin Yu uses very often blades that are 90 centimeters. That's almost you know close to three feet. And if you tried to do a Dushin movement with a blade that was you know, three feet long, you, you, the school suddenly becomes uh, stupid. The technique right. is no longer adapted. So your weapon was determined by how you used it, and how you used it was determined by your social uh, and cultural environment. Were you in the country? Were you in the city? Were you a, a, a bodyguard? Were you a soldier? Were you a functionary? just doing accounting, you know, and in which case you just carried around a short sword. You didn't need a big sword. And didn't, a, lot, a lot of people think that every samurai must have known how to use it, but there were many that really, they had to just carry it because it was a symbol of their class, but they really didn't know how to use it. So anyway, the other thing, um, now, you know, this image is here because uh, of we were going to talk a little bit about kante and what it means. And kante is, um, as I said, like a wine taster. He begins to study all the different places in a given country or in the world where wine is made and how it's made and what grapes they use and so forth. Well, it's the same with the sword. Mm -hmm. And to simplify matters, in the early days of the Nippon To, as opposed to what you saw a moment ago, the non-curved, double-sided or straight-edged blades that were mostly inspired by Chinese mm -hmm. uh, forging techniques. But when the Nippon To itself evolved and began to be the standard, standard weapon, um, it developed very characteristically in five different districts that they call Go, each ni san shi go, right? Go kaden. Kaden is the the, the, the five uh, fundamental schools basically. But that doesn't mean that there were only five schools right. and that's the only thing that they you know they where they made swords. They didn't. And here you see little yellow provinces. 
chikuzen, chikungo, uh, bichu, hoki, etchu. Um, these are all places where swords were made. Sometimes hoki, for example, is earlier than any of the five fundamental schools. Ah, uh, interesting, because it's facing the sea, close to the Korean Peninsula? Uh, very possibly. Okay. Very possibly. That, that surely had an influence. And as I say, what determined where they made swords and where centers of sword making developed were based on, as you wrote here, power, in other words, political power mm -hmm. and commercial power. In other mm -hmm. words, where can I sell the most swords. <laughs> so, if if there's you know if there's a, a, a place where there's a lot of warriors, yeah. well, they need a lot of swords. So, gee, if I'm a swordsmith, I move there, right? right. So, <laughs> so wherever there was power centers, there was always good markets for 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 selling swords. So that was a determining factor. Mm -hmm. So we see in that case. Yamashiro was the Kyoto region, right. and it's an early school. Mm -hmm. These weren't all the same time. I just say that in passing. Yamato was Nara, mm -hmm. which was the former capital before Kyoto. Right. And so that was an important part. So Yamato is really the first of the Gokaden, mm -hmm. and Yamashiro is kind of the second. And Bizen uh, comes out parallel. Now, Bizen is an example of something a little different. It wasn't a political center or a power center. It had an extraordinary amount of available iron ore. Mm -hmm. And that's the first material that you need in order right. to make swords, right? If you don't have any iron ore, you don't make swords. So that was an important thing. And um, Mino, for example, which is right smack in the middle of the country, mm -hmm as you can see, uh, it had not only iron ore, but it had a lot of forest. So it was really good for the charcoal oh. supply because charcoal, they were they needed a lot of charcoal. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I live in a place here in Connecticut and you look at pictures from uh, 18, you know, the early 1800s. There's not a tree on any of the hills. They were all cut down for making charcoal in order to make iron back in the revolution they were making iron in new england you know so it's the same thing no difference you can relate it to you know your experience with other places in the world so um this next picture of all the tanto which is um copied uh from a you know sort of a standard illustrative text in in a Japanese book, there you can look and anybody can see, geez, these blades look quite different, you know? You can maybe not know what the differences are, that doesn't matter, but you can look at it and you can say, geez, you know, they're as different as a Ford and a Chevrolet. You know, you don't you don't you don't make a mistake. You can see that. And and this is what the first step of the Kante Sha, he, he is required to be able basically to recognize a pre-1600 blade and place it in relation to one of the five schools if he can. It might not be, but that's okay. Um, the, others, the other places also have characteristics that will remind you perhaps of influence from the other schools. So, the five, remember, are Yamashiro, Yamato, Mino, Sagami, Bizen. So uh, here in front of you, you've got uh, Bizen blades. And there's a great variety. Bizen was one of the biggest centers mm. of, of sword making and over a very long period. And they st it's still a center for sword making, modern day sword making. And wow. So, yeah. And, and it uh, is, uh, yeah, this is also, you know, as you said earlier, it is also a story of the swordsmith, you know, and their lifelong experiences and experiments, right? And it's, 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 it's absolutely. absolutely in, in, in the, in the older days, it's only a modern thing, metallurgy, 
people have studied it scientifically we have instruments we can we can put g temperature gauges into the fire we can tell what temperature the the steel is at at a given moment i mean it, it, we've got all this they did not have that, not have that. Right. and so and they, so they functioned. functioned always empirically we do something something happens it's good well let's do it again so they make it into a kind of a kata or even a ritual so some you know you see swordsmiths dressed up in a shinto thing and they throw salt and they you know that was um, a very important thing was to be able to repeat empiricism mm -hmm. is learning something by trial and error until you get it right and then remembering how to get it right every time right refining, right. The, right. refining the protocol until you get it so you can do it and that's yeah. what they were yeah. doing in in those days and it's an amazing thing to see just how good and precise and um you know how competent they can be without all of the science that we would depend on today metallurgy and temperature gauges and everything else and how much they rely on instinct experimental or experiential instinct in other words you look at a, a the fire and uh, sometimes for example when you're welding uh, the the initial pile of steel that you see in step five and six shown um, that step is called sumiwakashi which means to boil basically to boil boil the iron and uh, when you have it in the fire you not only look you not only work very hard to control the temperature through the through the bellows that you have but you listen you hear the sounds of the steel and what temperature it is by listening if you can imagine you can hear the steel and you could say ah it's over a thousand right now that you know? is amazing. It, it sounds amazing but once you see it and you learn it and that's why somebody will spend five ten years as an apprentice he'll learn these things but he'll learn them ex experiential as an experience and he'll learn them um, through repetition and practice he won't learn them in a book and 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 that's the whole point and that takes a long time to to actually put all that together oh my goodness so, as you can imagine i don't know what time it is but we're it's... probably way up in time <laughs> no, I, 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 yes we have and we have my, uh, let, let me just say this that this subject is absolute it's crazy to try to do what i've just done to, tried to do tonight <laughs> is to uh, attempt to explain things um but at the same time i hope that some of the comments that uh, i had or you know gave would make things more understandable and simple and at the same time allow each of you to understand what a vast subject it is it's just so many things and they're just you know you in an hour you can only just touch the surface of certain things so um we said we would ask if anybody would be interested in another edition of this sort of thing uh, on a specific subject so uh, you know i don't want to uh say well we're going to do it again maybe you know it's it's not very you know it's not that interesting it, and it depends what do you want to do maybe one of you wants to do oh i'd love to learn more about history but I, the forge it looks too complicated i don't want to know about it well okay you can you can sort of say that so if you want to do another one i'm willing to um pick a subject that we've looked over this is an overview and an encouragement to learn about your 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 tool your weapon that you use in yai and to be totally relaxed realizing you don't have to know all this you can learn what you want and you can 
learn more if you wish to. And you can wait, learning so much, and then later on say, geez, I really, I really suddenly would like to learn more. To learn more. You know, you might, you, you, might, might, you might have a crazy have moment, crazy moment, moment I'm going to go to Japan, Japan, Japan and see if I can. See if I can. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I am, actually. I, 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 I wanted so much to learn about it that I went and studied with a swordsmith. My aim was not to become the swordsmith. It was to understand what they were doing. It, it really tempted me. So I got an invitation. <laughs> and I threw everything in the air and went away for t three years. You know, basically, it took me three years of, of, of time to, to and just brush the surface. And I'd never say, "Geez, I, you know, for I can, you know, I could, but I, I'm not I am a swordsmith. I don't, I'm not interested in being a swordsmith. <laughs> it's a hard I, life, I... <laughs> and they don't make a lot of money either. You don't become rich doing that." <laughs> I'm seeing the responses coming through the chat, and I think there's a sounding yes, please, ringing in the air. Um, okay, the well, if you want to do it, now the next question is simply, what aspect would you like? I've explained to you some of the aspects, and uh, it's simple. Think about it. Do you want to learn about history and evolution of the style, about how the sword actually was used from each one of the periods in Japanese history? Um, that's something that's interesting. Do you want to know, gee, how, how is a sword made? You know, how do we make steel? Maybe you just want to learn how do they make the steel to make a sword? It is special steel. You can't go down to your hardware store and, and buy yourself a chunk of steel and say, well, I'm going to make a Japanese sword with it. It won't make a sword. I mean, it will, but it'll make a shitty sword. I'm oh, sorry. A bad sword. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at the chat and I he I so they everyone's saying both the history a bit more deep dive into the history and evolution because we really yeah. you know scratch the surface today right um and then forging and if they can add one more I personally also like to add the third dimension that's the art you know that it's just it's beautiful you know the, the we talked a little bit about you, the tsuba you, but. You mean you mean the the Kante aspect? I think that'd be interesting as well. Um, if we can add to it, um, but I, I that's, I'm that 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 is the most complicated. Right, it's the imagine. one where people where people. I mean, it's like wine tasting. Look at look, go go to a wine tasting place and start talking to the people, and you sort of say, Jesus, this is uh, forget it. I, I'll just buy the wine and drink it if you don't mind. <laughs> It's it's a it's a complicated thing, so. Yes. Uh, so. Well, we could we could do, we could do one on the on how you forge it. Right. So forging, yes, and I think I am seeing also history, um, yes. Okay, but I mean, do the next one. We can try the forge if okay. everybody if feels comfortable with that, and that divides into two steel making. That's what I really was interested in is. I think it's a miracle, a uh, miraculous thing that somebody back in 1500 BC or whatever, whenever, I, we don't even know, he threw a rock or some rocks into his, <laughs> into his campfire and it was really hot. And when he looked in his fire the next day, he found this really hard stuff and it was iron and that iron uh, steel is only, it's called iron carbide, really. It's iron and Fe and carbon, C. Mm. Fec mm -hmm. is steel. So you cannot make pure iron except in a highly controlled um, mm -hmm. laboratory mm -hmm. situation. Okay? It, it's almost impossible to keep carbon out of. But mild steel is you know all over that's what we call like wrought iron or something like that it's just that there's no not enough carbon in there for the for it to have the characteristics of steel and become hard um so somebody came along mm -hmm. and in his little fire i don't know i think that's a, a miracle it just leaves me completely <laughs> How did that happen? You know, the invention of the wheel is the same, maybe, but a wheel is a hell of a lot more logic 
than somebody discovering how to make iron and steel mm. by constant. So uh, steel making is really interesting, and and that was my favorite thing. So that's one one aspect of the forging, and then once you get this lump of 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 cow pat, that's what it comes out of the thing looking like. Then what are you going to do with it? You know, and that's how you have to take it and refine it and refine it and make it into a into mm. a sword. And then once I've got it, so I can. That's number two, two, like... two, two part two. Then afterwards, how can I make that sword have the characteristics of a right. of a edged weapon that will stand up in combat? The whole problem is it has to be hard enough to hold an edge, but soft enough so that it's durable and won't break, right? You take a razor blade, it's good and sharp, but you can snap them in your fingers, right? right? They're very hard. Uh, you can take a piece of iron, for example, actually the, the Celtic warriors, they had soft iron swords, and so they would fight with the Romans, and their sword would bend in combat, and they'd put it on their knee and straighten it out and go back to fight. <laughs> <laughs> it was very practical. Whereas the Roman, the, the Roman swords were, were tempered hard, and uh, they broke in combat, and then that was their death if your sword right. broke in combat. Right, and they had to be a brain the spare, as I, I, I understand, um, because of that. That's happening a lot. Um, yeah. I so yes, um, so yes, a lot of yes and yes and yes and yes to this, yeah, still making um, and the forging as two separate session, maybe a little longer, hour and a half, maybe next time. Um, because you know, we cover yeah. a lot of grounds actually, um, right? Um, are there any specific questions, comments at this time? Yeah, you're welcome to ask a question if you wish. On the other hand, I'll, I'll also say in passing that those two little, um, you know, you found those two little films or, or little sequences. Um, they appeared really simple and kind of cartoon-like, right. but actually they were saying some really interesting, interesting. stuff. The, the problem is, is that nothing is interesting until you put it into its context, and then you can suddenly say, gee, that's very interesting yeah. you know uh so yeah. maybe you'll listen to it and think it's sort of fun or funny but it was actually very very uh comprehensive it was very good yeah, yeah. it was interesting i was looking for something that's about five minutes long um because it, you know longer than that you know we, we kind of lose the, the audience but within Absolutely. those five minutes in this like a comic way they actually capture a lot of interesting and very important details so on this one, yeah. well, um, that being said, there's a lot of very good films out there also that yes. are very serious and have been document. You know, they're documentaries and have done uh, that. They're very, very useful to to watch and to learn. Um, it's nice to have a somebody that can can sort of watch with you and comment that knows about it. Right. I've always that that was ah, my case. I, I I got to see. Uh, well, first of all, you know when you observe the smith you'd shut up and you watch and go and cut your cut your charcoal in a corner but at the same time a lot of the younger apprentices would kind of say look at this look and they'd give me a, a hint to look and uh, so looking at a film if you have somebody that sort of says oh look at that pay attention to that that'll help you uh see it um so Yes, that, I mean, actually, yeah, that, that's another idea. I mean, there, there were much longer um, documentaries on the sword making. So we could also yeah. do one evening when we, you know, this Zoom get together, watch a movie, drink wine, and just chit chat, rather than, you know, this kind of like organized yeah. conversation. That's another way of doing it. Well, I think it would be worthwhile composing a little list of some of the good films. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to um, sort of um, look, at the, look, at, okay. look at what they're about and and recommend one or two that I think are interesting and would be good. Okay. And then also a bibliography. There's yes. many, many, many books available to English speaking people now that 10 uh, or 20 years ago, you if you didn't learn how to read Japanese, you weren't going to be able to understand what the what, what was in the books. 
and uh, so yeah that's yeah that's so really actually there are there, there are requests for the reference the both the, in the book and film reference uh, suggestions yeah. so we'll take a note list of, of films where yeah. you can go look and learn and a list of a bibliography i think, yeah. I think that would be yeah. useful we can okay. do that. yeah that's suggestion to that um and also um yeah because we had a sound issues we will circulate this powerpoint and um, that has links to those two little youtube things um so mm -hmm. uh, that's that um yes well, so yeah we post links and there are specific questions coming in how I and mean, this is an interesting one how were schools passed down How were they passed out? Wow. <laughs> Actually, in in Europe, um, not so long ago, maybe it's not the case today, but families would actually commission an artist to have a family portrait. They would paint maybe the the, the father or the grandfather or whatever, and and you know you you go to an art museum and you see even some very famous painters. And these boring goddamn portraits, you know, Rembrandt, you look at him and he, and there's a portrait of a, of a, you know, a Dutch, Dutch merchant or something like that. Um, fundamentally is a picture. It's rather boring, but it was, it was the way to, to do things. And their existence today is exactly the same thing. In Japan, a sword was such a powerful object uh, with so much symbolism and so much um, attributed to it that people, instead of having a family portrait, you know, the equivalent, they would go and they would have a sword made, for example, uh, maybe as a bride's dowry or maybe for a young son who was growing growing up and they, and they would commission. And according to what their their social level was they could afford a greater a swordsmith a swordsmith that was more renowned um you know keep in mind that everybody lived the life in their own period so um a great swordsmith might have lived you know died 50 years before you would have to buy one of his swords you couldn't commission to have it made but that isn't how it worked. A lot of them were commissioning to have them made, and then they became a family heirloom. And of course, they'd be passed down. And if you had one in every generation, you would end up with a collection of 50, 60 swords after a few. <laughs> with the price tag, um, yes, it has to be like once the once a generation kind of investment. But I, I, yeah. I confess I did that. Um, so in Yushin, we have the uh, one of the you know the most famous swordsmith um, in Japan, Yoshihara Sensei. Um, he is the president Absolutely. of the yeah, All Japan Swordsmith Association. Um, and for yeah for Yushin and Yushin friends, um, you know we could that we could ask. Um, and and I actually had one made. Mm. Um, actually, it's very good to do that because what they what they do. They have their apprentice, their, their their students, and they have to work. Not only that, but they need to make their living in order while they're learning as well. And so, if they can make a sword for Yai, you're not trying to have a, a, an absolute masterpiece of a Japanese sword. And I can tell you right away that even if you would like to acquire a masterpiece it's going to cost you considerably more than one or two Mercedes Benz of the <laughs> higher category, yeah. uh, <laughs> even if you could. So it's a very expensive thing. But their, their apprentices, they need to practice and they need to work and they need to survive and get money. So it's a wonderful chance under the auspices, un, you know, under the watchful yeah. eye of somebody like Yoshihara, some of their best students will accept to make a sword for Yushin, for, for the practitioners in Yushin school. Yeah. And that's I mean, well worth it. You think, Jesus, how can I afford, you know, uh, seven, eight thousand dollars just for the blade? Today, um, it's it's peanuts. It's you're getting a blade that <laughs> down the line will m maybe get more valuable, but will never get less, I don't think so. Yeah, well, because well these worth, are well yeah. worth the 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 effort to do that, and then practicing. If you have a 
a cutting blade, your practice is going to change considerably from a Yaito, I can tell you. Anyway. Yes, exactly. And because 20, 30 years from now, those appendices are going to be the master swords, right? Because there are, there are only, only a few of them. Well, they, they, uh, will, they will move up in, yeah. you know, if they, if they remain there. And, and they might, you know, as time goes on, people do get better and better. And um, some of the things that were unthinkable 30 years ago for a swordsmith, they're actually achieving them. The only thing is, is that it's not new stuff. It's learning to be able to reproduce some of the things that were lost in 1500 or 1400. And they've rediscovered the, t the, the, the forging technique for that. So it's very interesting, interesting. very interesting. Yeah. Great. Anyway. Um, it's close to 10 o'clock, so I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, and there's a request for, yes, Yoshihara-san to speak. Um, yes, I will ask. Um, um,